Sandberg is as the founder and director of the Office of Scholarly Communication Services in the uh, Berkeley Library, um, where she helps uh, people on campus navigate the landscape of publishing, intellectual property, and information uh, to promote research dissemination, accessibility, and impact. Um, prior to coming to Berkeley in 2016, she was the head of reference and instructional services and a lecturer in law at the Stanford Law School for six years. Um, she has a Master of Library and Information Sciences uh, degree from the University of Washington and a JD from Duke. Um, and she was then an attorney for seven years for Fenwick and West, specializing in intellectual property and commercial um, litigation. Um, I first met uh, Rachel in the context of uh, her assisting the California Language Archive with um, a question we were uh, given about rights by, uh, that filmmakers were interested in, um, in archival content in our holdings, um, for which she was very helpful. Um, and I will quote you in the UC Press blog uh, in six years ago, where you um, said you hope to build a world-class program supporting scholars um, throughout the entire knowledge life cycle. Um, uh, so with that, uh, welcome, Rachel, to Linguistics. Thank you. It's really, really wonderful to be here talking to you today. I'm so glad to see all of you, um, and I hope you're not nervous. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, who actually owns things in your research, um, specifically in linguistics research, um, as between you and possibly your speakers or um, translators. And then we're also going to look at how other things like university policy or em your employment um, and the agreements that you enter into kind of override or can shape and affect what your rights are and, and what your speaker's rights are. And then we're going to look at the implications of all of that for what you publish um, and what you need to plan for in order to have um, to come away with the rights that you need to, to do what you want. So normally when I talk about these issues, I cover the whole spectrum um, of copyright and contract, um, but also privacy and ethics. And I know you guys have privacy and ethics covered a lot. Um, you, you think about your relationships with the, the people you're working with all the time. Um, and so today we are just going to focus on copyright and contract. But um, I, I want to kind of make clear that Sometimes we think, oh, well, I've already got the copyright thing down because I submitted an IRB proposal. And actually, IRB is only con really concerned with the consent that you get from people um, because they're implementing the federal common rule and also local policies around um, what, what participants actually agree to. And they're not, they don't act screen for copyright. Um, and this kind of falls through the cracks a lot. So it's important that we learn um, who owns things and what our rights are and, and navigate it ourselves. I'm also going to be um, sharing outcomes today of the default ownership rules and, and what the law is that are probably going to be very different from what you've heard um, third hand or, you know, from no offense, but from faculty <laughs> um, or, or anything else, because there's a lot of, there's just, it's a complicated area. And there are, it's very hard if you're not an expert to like describe it to other people. Um, and so there are a lot of misconceptions and don't worry about it. We're gonna get them all straight today. Um, but in order for us to do that, we do have to actually set kind of a foundational level knowledge of, of copyright. So. Like breathe, it's totally going to be fine. It's not scary at all. And I promise you're going to feel like an expert. Um, first, we're going to just learn a little bit about copyright, and then I'm going to show how it, um, how you apply it in your research. Okay. Rachel, would you be willing to minimize your, the, yeah. Thank you. And you can move it wherever you want. There you go. Okay. Um, okay. It's very bizarre to be sitting down. But I will for that video. <laughs> um, so what is copyright? Actually, does anyone want to try to hazard a little guess about what it is? It's okay, it's safety. 
Is it the exclusive rights? <laughs> so what does that actually mean? I understand it to mean, uh, well, if you're the author, that gives you exclusive rights over publishing it, allowing people to print it, especially making money off of it. Right, and so basically, that's that's very, very good. Um, basically, the Constitution authorized Congress to incentivize authors to create things. It said, create. you can create laws that encourage people um, to promote progress of the arts and, and sciences, and you've got to give them an incentive to do that, right? So if you give people exclusive rights in what they create, that is the incentive um, to make things. But if you allow those exclusive rights to exist indefinitely, then you're not promoting the progress of art and science because no one else can make use of things and continue to build knowledge. So the the carrot and the, the stick part of copyright is that um, copyright only lasts a certain period of time. And that would allow other people to use what come before and um, continue to build knowledge. And it also only protects original expression. Um, so there has to be some kind of creative spark in, in what it is that you're um, that you want to protect. So if we actually just apply that concept to this little diagram here, this is from um, a 2022 paper. Um, it is uh, an English uh, study that looked at a uh, took prompts from an original German study. Um, trying to now, I'm not going to use the right linguistic terms, and I'm mm -hmm. really sorry. But in my thumbs down um, parlance, uh, they took uh, they wanted to see how people construct um, sentences differently if it's a rhetorical question versus an information seeking question. And so the prompts that the original research team gave the people um, their test uh, people were okay, one um, at a party, your friend is serving shrimp as an appetizer, but it is obvious that all of your friends are disgusted by the rubbery stuff. And you ask your friends, and then what this study had people do is construct with just basic words, um, what what kind of sentence would you use in, in response to this kind of rhetorical question? And people's response was, who likes shrimp? And the other um, information, an actual genuine information seeking question was, at a dinner party, you're serving it, and generally you want to know who wants some. And the question would be, like, sure. Um, so in this example alone, we have multiple layers of copyright. We have the prompt that the original research team wrote. We have um, the English translation from the new research team. We have the diagram itself. Um, and how the new research team organized and wanted to display the previous information and the new information. And of course, we have the entire text of the article. All of that would be original expression protected by copyright. But even, even the original German? So that it's other it, people's copyright. It's other people's copyright, right. exactly. Um, so the other important thing for you as linguists to know is when copyright gets created. Copyright doesn't exist until that original expression is what's called fixed in a tangible medium. So um, if you weren't recording me talking today, um, nothing I'm saying is protected by copyright. But in the recording that's going to be put online for everyone, the words that I'm using and the order that I'm using them, that is my creative expression that's protectable. And that's what, what being fixed in tangible media means is that it can either be perceived with by humans through you know your senses or through um, machine assistance. Like if you were typing a word document, you have written down your words and it is now captured and you can read it through machine assistance. So obviously, in the context of our um, shrimp example, everything here. Um, is protect, you know, is the copyright is created in the recitation of it. But if you imagine the individuals who are responding to the prompt, um, who just say, who likes shrimp or like shrimp, unless the researcher was writing down what they were saying and recording it, 
nothing in what the um, speaker was saying would be protected by copyright. Okay, so we know that copyright protects original expression and it gives you exclusive rights. What are those exclusive rights? They were there's exactly what you were saying before, reproduction. So in the context of this paper, I can, if I were the author, I'm the only one exclusively who could make copies of my journal article and distribute it unless I had assigned copyright to the publisher. Um, because I alone have the reproduction rights. Derivative work. So I'm the only one who can change my plot, change um, anything that's in here and adapt it for a, um, you know, a later paper um, or take excerpts of this paper and put it into something else and, and create a work that's based on the original. That's what it needs to be a, a derivative work. Um, I'm also the only one who can distribute it. So I'm the only one who can um, not just make the copies under reproduction, but distribute them to people or grant a publisher of a journal the right to make that uh, distribution. Public performance um, doesn't work really well in the context of journal articles, but basically if, if I wanted to, I'd be the only person who could charge you for admission to come and listen to me read um, <laughs> the article. Um, and public display, I mean, if I wanted to, I could put the, every page of the article anywhere, um, and, and I'm the only one who gets to display it publicly, like, all at once. That's as the author. Mm -hmm. What about the publisher? Well, if, if this is, what I've described is um, the default for the author. If the author assigns those rights to a publisher, then the publisher would be the only one who can do those things. And we said copyright um, is the incentive is, is to give you those exclusive rights. The stick is the limited period of time. It's actually quite a long time. Um, currently, it's the life of the author or the rights holder in case it's, it's the publisher. Um, for their life, plus 70 years after they die. And that means that during that period of time, if you want to do any of those five things that I just mentioned, you need to get the permission of the right holder. So it's it's very it's a very robust um, situation. But you may kind of realize, well, but how are we? I know we can make other kinds of uses of things even during that time, and that is true. And that's true for a couple of reasons. You need permission to do any of those five exclusive rights, unless the things that are underneath aren't actually protectable by copyright to begin with. They're just facts or ideas. So those very brief sentences that the um, respondent form actually may not be protected by copyright. Just those two words that they put together um, if it doesn't have enough creative expression. Um, facts or ideas are not protectable by copyright to begin with, which means you should cite your source in using other in, in using faster ideas, but you don't need anyone's permission to use them, at least under copyright. Um, the other thing is you don't need permission if materials are in the public domain. And there are two main categories of work that are in the public domain. One is work for which copyright has expired. So those 70 years after death have lapsed and now all of this stuff is in the public domain. You don't need anyone's permission to, to do any of those five rights. And the other big category of works in the public domain are federal government works and some state government works. And then obviously, you don't need permission if an exception applies like fair use. And this is you know, what you use all the time in your scholarship. Um, you quote other people's things because you're relying on a fair use exception. To make you know to distribute and, and reproduce something that is protected by copyright. And I wish that we had unlimited time today to talk about all of this, but actually what I want to focus on is not your use of copyrighted materials, but actually who owns the, the copyrighted material? Who's the owner of that? And as we're gonna see, we've looked at, I said, you know, under the default copyright rules, um, the author is the owner of copyright. But there are three other sources of law and policy that you need to think about 
that actually can switch the default under copyright law around and can shape who actually owns things. The first is university policy, then how employment law interacts with copyright law, and then finally contract law. Um, so for example, the contract you sign with your speakers or if you're licensing um, material from an archive to use. So we'll look at, at each how each of these three things affect copyright law. Okay. University policy. Um, the good news is under university policy that they try to mirror what the default rules under copyright law are. So within the University of California, faculty or um, scholars who create original materials get to keep copyright just as they would under, under regular uh, default copyright law. Um, and that is a matter of university policy, not overriding what the underlying law is. And same thing for students and um, graduate students, undergraduate. You're making academic, uh, you know, you're, you're writing papers, you're doing research, all of that gets to stay yours. Except if it's in the context of employment. Um, so if you have been, you know, um, uh, hired to actually record people or or interview people, then that falls under um, the third caveat of the university policy, which is basically staff and employees. And for staff and employees, the university owns the the copyright. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that apply to us as graduate students or? Employed by the we're gonna do a little okay. test example. <laughs> um but for now stay, stick with this and then we'll we'll um we'll have you uh test your knowledge. Specifically you. So that's university policy. Then you also have how employment laws interact with copyright law, and the university policy also tries to mimic what uh, the way that employment law interacts with copyright law. And the, the basics under employment law are that if you are an, an actual employee of a, an institution, then that institution or that employer owns the copyright in, your, in the work that you create in the scope of your employment. Um, that's because Works created in the scope of employment are considered what are called works for hire. And the rules under copyright law are that works for hire are owned by the employer. Um, so what happens if you are a graduate student, just hypothetically, <laughs> um, uh, employed, you know, employed to do or, or you know, you have some contracts to actually do research. How do you think that that would play out under this theory of, of employment law interacting with copyright law? Oh, this is directed at me. It is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that it's the former um, right, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. If you actually are retained to do that, then in the absence of a contract that specifies otherwise, mm -hmm. the default under employment law would be that the institution or your employer owns the copyright in it. Now imagine um, that you're an undergraduate employed at the library or the dining hall um, writing a paper. You are a university employee. You are not writing that paper in the scope of your employment. And so that absolutely stays your copyright. Yeah. If you're a graduate student creating a section handout, how does that fall in? So most likely you're gonna have that's where we're gonna get into the contracts that override what the oh. default policies mm -hmm. are. Like I could answer that under default copyright law. Probably, well, you would probably are hired to, to create those for the class. So it probably would be the universities, but there may be a contract that you sign separately that says something to the contrary. Um, contracts, that's the power of contracts. Basically, this whole session is on the power of contracts mm -hmm. and what you need to think about putting into them because 
they they can override all of these things. We have a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, if, if you were to volunteer for a nonprofit, would the nonprofit policy matter in similar way to in a similar way as a university? Um. So it can we hold that one for the because I I expect that there are going to be a lot of well, what about this? What about this? Um, we can do we can do that then. Um. Okay. So those are the basics under employment law. We need to think about what it means to be employed, though. So that is the difference. That what it means to be employed really shapes whether or not the author or creator holds copyright. <clears throat> Remember, we said that if you're employed, that's what um, uh, establishes, and you, and you create something that relates to your employment duties or is in the scope of your employment, that's what is a work for hire. But if you're not actually an employee, um, then you're an independent contractor. And the default copyright rules for independent contractors are that they hold copyright. Um, and unless you have a contract that says otherwise, every single person you interview and record owns their copyright. You don't have copyright in any of that. If you're recording what, what they're saying, they are not your employee. There, there are tests for what constitutes an employee and they look at things like, can you supervise them in other activities? Do they get benefits? Um, how much can you direct about um, the, the, the outcome? So all of the people that you are working with are independent contractors. And if you don't have an agreement that says copyright is transferred to you or that you have a license from them, they're the, they're the copyright holders. Yeah. In the context of like linguistic research mm -hmm. in which we work with like multiple consultants who could be viewed as independent contractors, what if there is explicit language within our informed consent forms that um, addresses those concerns, right? So um, you would need an agreement in writing for them to actually transfer copyright to you. Right. So like what if in our informed consent form it is written there that you do not own the rights to this information that I have gathered and they sign off on it. Perfect. So that is that's exactly what we're talking about, how um, an agreement can override what the default rights are. Um, so before we talk more about the agreements, I want to also kind of touch on a little bit of something you said around um, multiple people. Imagine that you are not just recording someone, but you're interviewing them, you're doing an oral history, um, and or you've given them written prompts and they're responding to it. What do you, well, I mean, the, the, the reality is that if you both intended, or if all of you intended for the outcome to be a unified thing that you all jointly hold copyright in, then you all jointly hold copyright in that interview. Um, and that would mean that all of you can do the five exclusive things that I mentioned without having to get permission from the other. But what you can't do as the joint owner is assign any of those um, exclusive rights without the consent exclusively. Like you, you can't license them to say, oh, publisher, you can publish this work exclusively without the consent of the other joint copyright holders. You can publish, but you can't give the right to publish exclusively without the permission of the other. Otherwise, if you did not intend that interview to be a joint copyright work, then you have copyright in what you said and wrote down, and they have copyright in the state that and wrote down. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I, if this is a context where it's like doing an elicitation, for example, so like mm -hmm. me asking in English or French or something, and then if I have copyright over what I wrote down, but I'm writing down what they're saying. They have copy, I and mean, you're, it's not the act of writing, it's the expression that's protected. So okay. they have copyright in their expression. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to do, um, just as you were suggesting, we're going to do a couple of examples. Um, okay. So you, um, hand someone 
three. Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry. The last point seems that it it kind of hinges on the intention, mm -hmm. like the collaboration. Did, did it intend to be a joint? Yeah. Copyright or not? How, how is how, how is that how, determined? How, yeah. <laughs> so that's determined um by a court oh. who looks at it <laughs> and says um, when they found it. But but the the takeaway is. Don't get to that point. Yeah. Have a good agreement that says that spells it all out, and yeah. then you don't have to worry about any of it. Okay. So what we're going to do now are the like scenarios under the default rule, and then we'll look at what your agreement should say. Um. So you find like some text, and you have someone translate it. Who holds the copyright in that? I'm sorry, one more time. Okay, you find some someone else made a text. Sorry, I'll, the gesticulation may have confused you. Um, you find a, a previously written text by someone, and you have someone else, a speaker or somebody else, translate it for you. The original author. No, the translator. The translator owns it because in the translation it. because yeah, right. that's the original expression of the um the translator. The original author owns copyright in the underlying right. work, but the speaker. With, in the absence of an agreement saying otherwise, the speaker is the one who's going to own copyright in the translation. And translation counts as expressive enough, even though the literal content is well, the same. Well, transliteration might be different, but translation, you're using, you're making decisions. Right. You know, like the word love could have like 30 different, you know, Right. Very so, philosophical question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So the speaker or the translator would own copyright because they are not your employee. It's not a work for hire. Okay. You write a text and someone translates it for you. And you own you your own own exactly. Unless, remember, unless you intended the output. To be something that you jointly own together. And that would need to be really manifest in the discussions you are having with them. Um, any work exactly. Yeah. It can't be like ex post facto, you've decided this is now a, a joint copyright. Does anyone remember what it means? Um, if it is joint copyright, what you can and can't do? Give yeah, away the right. Exactly. Without consulting with majority owner. You guys are. <laughs> <laughs> you were. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend picking up a law school loan. Especially if you then stop practicing in a firm and go work at a university. <laughs> um, but okay, you record someone speaking. It's tricky, but I want to say the speaker still. Yeah. yeah. And what is the recording? Yeah, that's where I'm saying it's tricky because the digital artifact itself, who owns that? Like Probably artifact. nobody. Okay. Because and the physical oh, item, yeah. it's yours, right? You you created it. But as far as, as, far as intellectual property in that, in the recording, mm -hmm. if all you're doing is sticking a recorder on a table, there's no original or creative expression in that at all. Mm. So the speaker holds copyright in, as if you take the recording, the speaker has copyright in the words that they're using in the recording, but you do not have copyright in the recording itself. Now, you can imagine situations where you're filming an oral history and you are making certain decisions about how people look. This goes back to your um, example of um, uh, Kaylee Cuoco in um, <laughs> Big, Bang Big Bang Theory was taking a, a photo of um, constellations and like, did she have uh, copyright in the photograph? Mm -hmm. And all she did was press the button, mm -hmm. but didn't decide what the, the photo the looked like. The exactly. Right. Um, but if you did have copyright in the um, the the oral history recording because you're making creative decisions, it would only be as to the creative decisions you've made in the recording and not the underlying content, which would still be the speakers unless they've assigned it to you through an agreement. Okay, um, you interview someone and record or, or transcribe it so it has both yours and theirs. The recording goes to the speaker and the translation is yours. Or it depends whether you jointly intended it. Exactly. If it was, if you intended it to be a joint output then you're both then your joint ownership of the copyright otherwise what you were saying yours is yours and theirs is theirs and no one probably has copyright over the recording itself if all you've done is just 
stick it on the table and, and you know, press it. But meaning the words that I utter, I own the copyright to, and the words that they utter? Correct. Regardless of whether I wrote down both sets of words. Well, as long as it's captured, right? It has to be fixed. Sure. So as but long the recording as alone would be enough to fix it. The, re yeah. the recording fixes them. So all of this is to say that, my goodness, we really need to make sure that the agreements we sign with people sort all of this out because a lot of what you're doing, you actually do not have copyright in. Mm -hmm. So you have a couple of options. And obviously we're just going to touch at this at a very high level today, but you have a couple of options for what you for how to structure those agreements. You can, as you were suggesting, have them in the forms they sign transfer everything to you. Um, you can also in the agreements they sign give them a license back to do some of those exclusive things because it's kind of mean, right? If you don't, it's not very nice if you don't let people do things with what they're giving you. So you mm -hmm. grant them <laughs> you grant them a license back um, to do things um, on a non-exclusive basis. Mm. Alternatively, you can expressly structure the agreement as an, an intention or manifestation of joint ownership, which would mean if you want to publish something um, and, and the publisher asks for an exclusive right, you would also need the speaker or the translator's um, permission to uh, grant that to a publisher. Alternatively, third option, they keep copyright, but they grant you a license to do what you need in your research. Um, and that sounds very friendly, right? Um, especially, you know, you don't want to think about like exploiting people. Um, so let them keep rights, but but give you the right to do what you need in your research. So what is it that you need the right to be able to do? If you're gonna go with that third option where they keep copyright but grant you rights. You really need to plan ahead and think about all of the ways that you possibly might want to make use of the, the recording or, or elicitation or anything else over the course of your career. Obviously, um, you may want to publish. You also may want to preserve it and give it to, um, you know, give it to Zach or give it to a library or put it in a digital archive online. And Doing that is reproduction and distribution. So if they don't give you a license for reproduction and distribution um, in the license grant that they give you, you don't have the right to do that unless your use is a fair use. But, but it's very important that your contract gives you all of the things that you want. If, you know, if you're choosing that they grant you a license, you need to think ahead to publishing, preserving, putting it in an archive, teaching with it, Creating derivative work, anything you might want to do over the course of it. Yes. I thought that um, like putting online would count as publication, but it, like let's say I'm interviewing you and I'm just all I'm doing is writing it down on paper, mm -hmm. and all there exists is this one paper copy. Right. Um, you own the copyright to it. Surely I can give it to a library without your permission. You can give it to a library, or but if you that. want it to be online, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, oh, but because you own the physical material and you can dispose of or distribute the physical material how you want. But as a researcher, if you want anyone to be able to, you know, you need to share your data or you need, um, you want other people to be able to make use of it and read it, it doesn't give you the right to do that. You don't actually need their permission to give your material to an archive just for the archive to be able to Correct. publish it or whatever. Under a separate provision of copyright law, um, you're exercising essentially what's considered to be the first sale doctrine, which means you can dispose of it um, and you know however you want, but it's the copyright in it is theirs. Um, so because you need to think so far ahead about all of these permutations, it may be that you want your contract for it to be copyright to you and a license to them rather than copyright to them and a license to you because what if you don't think ahead far enough to all the kinds of uses you want to make but you can see there are like pros and cons from an interpersonal like ethical consideration um so if you are going to go this route it would help to you know kind of talk to us and think about um how, how best to cross the agreement yeah um i'm just thinking that it's you know it's if they own copyright and they've like sorry, 
if you don't copyright new license to them, you also need to think ahead with them about how they might want to use it. And yeah. If they, don't cover, if, they, if they don't cover all of their bases, that might, you know, rob them of some opportunities to use their own work too. But yeah. Exactly. And um, I think some of the thornier questions there are around commercial uses mm -hmm. and um, whether or not they want to reserve you know, commercial uses for themselves, or you want to grant them uh, commercial uses. Um, you can all you can do anything with contracts, so you can make it as difficult um, as you want in terms of like, well, if there are royalties from you know because your book is going to sell like, wild that's that's yeah, um, that that they get you know a certain percentage of royalties. All of that can be um, addressed through the agreement. I think there might be a question in the chat. Sorry, I heard you. Oh, no, that's well, the same I, question from the board. Yeah, I just had a quick question about if um, contracts can be revised at this next meeting. Oh, I don't see why that would be, would be desirable. We're going to talk about that in the next slide. <laughs> yeah. My question was about in, if you're doing all this in a different country. Yeah. Who's mm -hmm. law apply? Yeah. Yeah. That is a great question. That is not a question that we. So, um, you can go to another country and have a contract that says U.S. law applies <laughs> and really? U.S. law applies. Can you say Brunei like, law applies in your contract? You could if you wanted to, but you should understand that if you get sued, you're going to Brunei to, <laughs> to, to deal with all of that. So um, you want your agreement to be useful to you later. Um, now, if your agreement is silent, then you get into felony areas because like they could in Brunei um, bring a claim and you would need to convince the Brunei court that they don't have jurisdiction over you and that that instead um, or let's say a judgment was entered against you in Brunei um, they would need to convince a U.S. court to enforce it against you better to just specify in the agreement that um, and not just U.S. but um California and like it will be in um, copyright is, a, is, is federal is a federal law so it would be in the federal courts of, of California or wherever you get your job. Yeah. So say um, I my um, co collaborators or consultants have uh, copyright over the like web work that we produce but they gave me a license to publish. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that I get to publish the work that we created together without their approval or like it depends what the license says. Um, it, the license will probably say you have a, a, a right to publish non-exclusively. So you can go tell a um, uh, University of California Press that you want to do a book and it has excerpts from your joint work and you don't need permission from the other um, joint, own, joint owners to include those excerpts because they've given you, um, well, they don't need to give you a license to, if, if it is really a joint, ownership scenario. They don't need to give you a license to publish. It's only if University of California Press wanted the exclusive right uh -huh. to publish it. Then you would need the consent of your other joint owners. Even after they gave the license to publish. I'm not sure why they would yeah. give you a license if they are joint owners of you, but maybe the license, let's imagine the license is for you to publish exclusively. You're the only person who that you would need their consent. Um, to be the only person who can publish with that work. Does that make sense? Maybe like in ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so to answer your question about what if you do an EC, right? Um, <laughs> you you have a bunch of stuff you've done over the course of your career. Um, you can try to get a writing later. And it you just again, contracts are amazing. You can say, remember that thing we did? Um, how about you assign me all of the rights in that agreement? And now I get them. Mm -hmm. And that controls um, everything that you've done before. Um, but I think, especially in linguistics, but in a lot of cases, you might not be able to get a contract. Like Zach was telling me about like trading in fish hooks. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of times when maybe people don't know how to write. So um, what do you do in scenarios where you can't get an agreement um, to do the things that you want to do. It becomes just a question of risk, really. Um, so 
if no agreement is actually possible, what are the odds that um, someone would actually try to enforce their, even though they technically hold copyright and in, in what they translated or, or said to you in the recording, what are the odds that they try to enforce that? But it is something you need to think about if you can't get an agreement um, in what you tell a journal or a library or a book publisher. Um, you don't actually hold copyright in that. You had communications with them that, and in which they said, do what you want with it. But depending on how risk averse the journal or the book publisher is, um, that may or may not be good enough for them. Um, you can also think about, you know, if you wanted to, um, as Andrew was saying, like, you now want to donate all of your recordings to a library. Yeah, you can absolutely do that if you don't have a contact with something, someone. Nothing stops you from donating all of the recordings to a library. But when the library or um, online repository thinks about what they can make available, you don't hold copyright in the underlying material. And so depending on how risk averse the library or um, archive is, they may not want to reproduce and, and distribute that material. Um, again, we do have rights to make certain, to do those exclusive uses limited rights under fair use, but depending on how risk averse um, the entity is, they may not want to rely on that. Yeah. One relevant scenario that affects some graduate students and other people is as you're doing field work somewhere, you have no contract, which is typical. Um, you come back, you want to donate your recordings to an archive like the CLA or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some of it is sensitive, you think. And so you don't want that part to be online. In some cases, some of it is so sensitive, you don't even want the names of the people mm -hmm. to be identified online. But you have no contract with them. Yeah. And then somebody, so normally what the practice has been to honor the request of the donor, doesn't actually have the legal right to kind of insist on that request. So somebody could come along and sue um, saying, oh, I actually have copyright in those recordings that you know, Emily said, don't put online, and we would lose, um, potentially, if there was no contract, such as that, if the speaker or the speaker's kids or whatever. Um, so that's an interesting kind of scenario. It conflates a few different things, though, that, that actually stay separate in the decision making of what to put online. So that, I, mean, I just flipped back to the kind of four pillars of, of um, literacies or, or, or rights issues. From a copyright perspective, it's actually quite simple. You don't hold copyright if the library wants to put it online. They're making a decision, a fair use decision or not. And if the um, speaker later wants to, to sue, they would sue the library. Um, and the library would need to defend in court that it was um, a, a fair use. But you also mentioned you as the researcher wanting to um, tell the library whatever you decide to do library block out certain pieces from ever going online you can do that through contract that can absolutely be in your gift or, or, or donation agreement mm -hmm. the library independently regardless of what your agreement with them says has an obligation to comply with privacy laws so if there are actually privacy laws that affect um, the, the individuals, that's on the library to make sure that they honor them. Now, there are a lot of exceptions, and we could have a whole separate thing about what people think is private and what is actually private. Um, really, we, our conception of privacy is more around ethics than what is actually legally protected. But it doesn't matter. You, you can, as out of the kindness of your heart, ask the library and the agreement to protect the privacy of these individuals, but they have an obligation regardless if they were going to make it available online mm -hmm. um, under uh, under privacy law. Yeah. Um, I think I'm still a bit confused about what fair use covers. <laughs> because you couldn't really, yeah. So in such a short period of time, I made this okay. about ownership okay. and not what you can do under fair use. Um, but basically, the kinds of uses you're making, like I want to take a paragraph yeah. and use it in my journal article of what someone said, or 
um, use it in my book, or I'm teaching and I'm, you know, I'm showing uh, the, the writings that, that someone made. Mm -hmm. All of those, there, there are four factors to consider. It's meant to pr promote like the scholarly discussion and, and critique and debate. So all of those kinds of things um, that you do in the course of your work likely to be fair use. But if you're taking an entire thing of someone that, and want to publish a book, that may not be fair use. So you really do need to, um, you know, yeah. So what I'm really getting from this whole conversation is just get it in writing at first, like be at four <laughs> coming. Yes. <laughs> you don't ever want to worry about what you're allowed to do. Then have the agreement say what you're allowed to do and make it as broad as possible. Um, and then just decide if you, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Build off of that. Um, relating what Sushita was asking about, could it be written in the contract that any um, any terms in the contract can be subject to like revision or revisiting it and updating it as much as they need to? Usually what agreements say is that if you want to do a modification, that the modification has to be agreed by both parties and in writing. Right, exactly. So, so both parties have to sit down again, renegotiate the contract, get a final version, both sign it, and then that's the new one. Mm -hmm. Agreement that's in place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about um, so in IRB context, yeah. we often say, like, okay, well, it's not appropriate to get written consent or have maybe someone doesn't write. Right. Stuff, so we'll get verbal consent mm -hmm. instead. Is there a verbal version of a contract? There is, but. um. Like if I recorded a conversation, I said, here is what I am allowed to do, here's what you are allowed to do, do you agree? Yes. Yeah. We absolutely can have a verbal contract. And in fact, I could like just start performing things for you and you pay me for things and our actions can create a contract. However, from a copyright perspective, first of all, if a contract can't be performed within a year, it needs to be in writing. But also from a copyright perspective, um, if you want to transfer, if you're interviewing me, I have the rights and everything I'm saying. If we don't put that in writing, like all transfers of copyright have to be in writing. So that's why we get into the situation of well, then the contract really isn't possible because you can't transfer copyright unless that's in writing. Yeah, and then this takes a very like literate kind of approach yeah. to things because of what if we what if we are in the field in a country in which the lingua franca is not the language we're putting in the contract, or they can't even understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there are and there are ten million different reasons why you might not be able to get a contract, and it really just becomes like a risk management situation. They're they're not going to do anything, most likely. You have an interest in maintaining good relations with them. You're not going to exploit them because you're a good person. Um, but um, <laughs> um, when you go to publish. It is something you would disclose that um, this was a verbal agreement, and you know, here's where we are. Mm -hmm. If uh, I know I'm getting into another what if here, but um, no, that I anytime you talk about copyright, you talk for five minutes and then it's five <laughs> hours of what if. Um, situations where the original where there has where there was no contract, but the one one or more of the parties involved is deceased. Mm -hmm. Does that then go to the heirs of the person? Their copyright um, would be, the, the transfer of their copyright would be governed by um, a will or a deed in, in their jurisdiction. Um, and in the absence of that, it would be governed by the default laws about how succession happens in that jurisdiction. So, um, Typically, you it typically it is the heirs, but that's either because the will said it was the heirs, or because the default rules in that jurisdiction make it the heirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight a few things. Also, thinking about the time, which is one you brought up earlier, this distinction between employee and independent contractor, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to point out that in sort of the classical fieldwork case. Most of the people we work with are not even independent contractors. They are people we pay out of pocket in the field and get reimbursed for. They are not vendored by the university. That is an independent contractor, though. They're, okay. It's with you, though. It's not with okay. the university. It's not with the university. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, the second thing is that, you know, in the course of a graduate student's career, there are often, any one graduate student is often toggling back and forth between some semesters in which you're hired as a GSI or a GSR with a very specific set of job responsibilities mm -hmm. and terms in which you're on either a fellowship of some kind or mm -hmm. something similar. And in those off semesters, you're not hired with a specific research output in mind. And so I would assume that copyright devolves to the graduate student in those cases as yes. opposed to the university. Yes. And also, wouldn't it be terrible if the university like tried to claim copyright in all of the grad student things? So you have to understand, like even in those situations where technically you are an employee that semester, the university is not going to take action to try to like prevent you from publishing. If anything, they want you to publish because it looks good for them. Um, but you could, if you wanted to, if you were concerned, request from um, the the tech transfer office, um, you know, that to, to get something clarifying that you know, the work that you did during that is yours. But really, like it's low risk as between you and sure. the university, sure. the higher risk is between you and the speakers or, or translators. Go ahead. Sorry, no, no, go for it. Just uh, the third thing I wanted to emphasize is just an extremely frequent case, which sort of brings together some of what you talked about, which is um, translation-based interviews, basically, where from what we've been discussing, I hold copyright to what I utter in the recording and the speaker holds copyright on what they utter in the recording. Every academic, for the most part, has turned around and published solely under their name mm -hmm. the written content of what the speaker said mm -hmm. um, without any declaration of who has the rights to any of it. And is that, strictly speaking, a copyright infringement on the copyright of the speaker? Um, so if it was a fair use, it's not an infringement on the copyright of the speaker. Um, so but there, you know, I'm sorry to like break it down into steps. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you could have intended it for it to be a joint work, and in which case, you don't need the speaker's permission to do it. You sit down and say, we're doing an interview. We realize I'm going to be publishing this, right? Yes, okay. And this is going to be ours collectively, right? Move the academic moves forward. Nobody's actually doing that. But um, alternatively, the, the um, uh, academic moves forward and uses excerpts of the interview in a journal article. Fair use. The, the real issue is I'm pu I'm putting the entire interview online. I'm publishing the entire interview in this book. And um, in those cases, technically, you do need the permission, most likely, of the, the speaker. If you don't have a contract that gives you the right to do it, right? What it's going to come down to is how risk averse is the publisher. But what if the publisher is you? You're the one setting it online, right? How risk averse are you? Mm -hmm. Okay. I put a question in the context of, say, a dictionary. Mm -hmm. Some words are rare and known only by one old man who told it to you. Some words are really common, and in, after living there a couple months, you could come up with them yourself. So, how does the copyright of the whole dictionary work? That's a great question. What do we know about what gets protected by copyright? And what does it? Facts can't, can't be. So individual but words, like individual words, not protectable. But the compilation, your decision to okay. say this is the entire whatever of you know of this, but what is protected in the dictionary is the like um, your your decision to include these words and the arrangement of them. Now there's not a lot of creativity in just a dictionary, right? If like well, every, uh, <laughs> but 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 what you're talking about really is that like annotations and not the like just the words or or the sentences you're using just explain what they mean. So that is creative expression. Otherwise, the dictionary as a whole is just the arrangement that gets protected. Well, your question is a word known to one person, a fact or a creative expression, mm -hmm. right? It has nothing, the who holds it doesn't matter. A word is a word, and a word is not protected by copyright. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That could go for but, almost any example that a speaker gives you. They're just merely telling you that that's what that means in their language. That's a fact. Um, that is true, and you should cite them because yeah. that's what academics do, but you don't need their permission to use it. <laughs> but what if they give you a sentence, right, where they put original expression together in a string of words? 
then that is a complicated word. Yeah. Sorry? Word that has yeah. many pieces. <laughs> Um, a word that has many pieces, if they explain what all of their different pieces mean, they're creating original expression in their explanation. Do they have copyright in it? Yes. Can you use it? Probably yes under fair use. Right, 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 right. This is building on the dictionary idea. If you add an audio recording to a dictionary entry, it's going to be unbroken the whole time. Um, so yeah, so you have a dictionary of like words, maybe some sentences, phrases, whatever, but like then you have a clip of an interview mm -hmm. that's attached to like each of those entries. Mm -hmm. Is that then let's say like I, the researcher who did not make a contract that gives me the copyright infringing on anything, or is that fair use? So I need a little more context. Like whose dictionary is this? Oh, is it your business? Did I turn the recording off? Oh, no. oh, yeah. I'm thinking, like, it's a collaboration. I don't want to call the dictionary just mine because I couldn't have created it without the people I work with. Okay. But like I have put in more time if I'm not gonna make them so, so let's let's say that you thought it really was a collaboration with them, right? Um the creation of the dictionary and the interviews that are components that are gonna go in it. There's an argument that you all intended it to be a joint work, um, in which case you don't need their permission. You're a joint copyright um, holder of that. The only time you might need permission is if it were a situation where you only own what's yours and they only own what's theirs. And then you'd need to think about is your use fair? Mm -hmm. And it, otherwise, if it's not fair, you would need to get their permission. Okay. There have been some notorious cases in Australia of. Dictionary theft by predatory publishers. You would like go to your online dictionary, maybe, or some other mm -hmm. lexical database, take all the words and publish their own dictionary. Mm -hmm. And then people get very angry about that, of course. And they say, well, it's not copyright. You can't sue me. And there true. may be a contractual layer, though. If it's from a database, the database may have terms of use that govern regardless of whether there's underlying copyright in the no, I think in these cases, the they were the linguist in question that we kind of I need. Um, I want to touch on something that you raised though about oh it's one person, the one person, the only, the only person who knows that thing. That's not a copyright issue if that person knows that word. It may be a traditional knowledge issue, but that's not a concept that's protected in the US. Um, the World Intellectual Property Organization has guidelines and some other countries do protect traditional knowledge. But there's nothing in the U.S. that would, um, you know, govern the, the fact that I'm the only one who knows this idea. I'm assuming you probably want to just come with your specific things anytime and, and just like pepper everyone in our office with all of these kinds of questions. And I just want you to know that we're available for you to do that. Um, some of us even enjoy it. <laughs> Um, so I hope that this was helpful.